Hello, everybody. My name is Pablo Wojcicki. I'm a faculty member at Northwestern University and the director of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you so much for joining us for today's weekly virtual seminar of the Center. It is really a pleasure to have you with us. The mission of the Center is to create knowledge about digital media in Latinx and Latin American communities across the Americas. Today's speakers are leading scholars in this space. Natalia Aruguete is professor of the Uni Universidad Nacional de Quilmes and Universidad Austral and a member of CONICET, Argentina's federal agency for the development of science and technology. Ernesto Calvo is professor of government and politics at the University of Maryland and director of the Interdisciplinary Lab for Computational Social Sciences there. Facundo Suenzo, a doctoral student at Northwestern and a graduate affiliate at the Center for Latinx Digital Media, will introduce them in just a minute. I am delighted to note that today's talk is co-sponsored by the Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities, the Buffett Institute for Global Affairs, the Center for Global Culture and Communication, the Department of Communication Studies, the Department of Radio, Television and Film, the Latin American Caribbean Studies Program, and the Latina and Latino Studies Program. Before we go into the seminar, however, I would like to start by acknowledging that Northwestern is a community of learners situated within a network of historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. It is also in close proximity to an urban Native American community in Chicago and near several tribes in the Midwest. The Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Orawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk nations. It was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes, and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about native peoples and the institution's history with them. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion, Northwestern works towards building relationships with Native American communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service, and enrollment efforts. Let me say briefly uh, how the seminar will unfold. First, Facundo will tell us more about Natalia's and Ernesto's research and career in just a minute. Then Natalia and Ernesto will deliver their seminar. After that, we will open for questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&A function of the webinar. Facundo will moderate. Feel free to enter the questions at any point in time. At the end, we will deliver some closing remarks. Once again, many thanks for joining us. Without further ado, Facundo, the screen is all yours. Thank you, Pablo, uh, and hello, everyone. I'm uh, very honored to have been invited uh, today's seminar to introduce these very admired scholars, uh, Professor Natalia Aruguete and Professor Ernesto Calvo, and to co-moderate this presentation at the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Natalia Aruguete holds a PhD in social sciences, is researched at the CONICET, uh, the Argentinian Federal Agency for the Development of Science and Technology, She's also a journalist and a professor at the Universidad Nacional de Quilmes and Universidad Austral, both in Argentina. Professor Aruguete holds a degree in communication from the Universidad de Buenos Aires and a master's degree in economic sociology uh, from the Instituto de Altos Estudios Sociales at UNSAM. She has taught undergrad and graduate courses at multiple universities in Argentina, Uruguay, Chile, Ecuador, Colombia, and Spain. She's also a special journalist collaborator in the Argentinian newspaper Pagina 12 and in Le Monde Diplomatique Ediciones Conosur. She has written almost 50 articles published in specialist, uh, specialized journals uh, from different countries, such as uh, Digital Journalism, Journal of Communication, and the Journal uh, Profesional de la Información, where she, where she has been exploring the relationship between political media and public agendas in the, in the dialogue between traditional and social media. She is also the author of three books on this area, Teorías de la Opinión Pública y la Construcción de la Agenda, El Poder de la Agenda, Política, Medios y Público, and recently released Fake News, Trolls y Otros Encantos, co-author with Professor Calvo. Professor Calvo is Professor of Government and Politics at the University of Maryland and Director of the Interdisciplinary Lab for Computational Social Science. 
Professor Calvo obtained his degree in political science from the Universidad de Buenos Aires and his PhD in political science as well from Northwestern University. Before joining the University of Maryland, Professor Calvo had been assistant professor at the University of Houston and guest professor at many distinguished universities around the world, such as Universidad Torcuato y Vela in Argentina, the CIDE in Mexico, and the Universidad de Salamanca in Spain, among others. His research focuses on the study of comparative political institutions, political representation, and social networks. He's the author of Non-Policy Politics with uh, Victoria Murillo, Legislature Success in Fragmented Congresses in Argentina, and over 70 publications in Latin America, Europe, and the United States. Professor Calvo has received several awards in the field. The American Political Science Association has recognized his research with the Lawrence Langley Award, the Lubert Best Article Award, and the Michael Wallerstein Awards. He has recently received the, the Excellence in Research Award from the College of Behavioral and Social Science at the University of Maryland. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Aruguete and Professor Calvo. Thank you so much, Facundo. Um, and thank you everyone for, for joining uh, today for the webinar. Um, I'm gonna be sharing my screen and I'm gonna be um, starting um, with a few slides and then pass the torch uh, to Natalia. So let me, without further ado, um, share my screen. So uh, first, uh, I want to thank everyone. Um, um, thank you so much, Pablo and Mora and Faku for the invitation to present here. Uh, we also want to thank you know, several colleagues with whom we've been working in the last uh, few years. In particular, Tiago Ventura has co-authored several of the articles uh, that advance the same uh, agenda. Uh, with Pablo Clerici and Sebastián Vallejo, we've been expanded the, the reach of the Laboratory for Computational Social Science. And thank you so much, of course, uh, to our colleagues at Northwestern University, which, by the way, as, as Faku mentioned, was my alma mater uh, for my PhD. So it's always fun being back, even though it's through Zoom. So, so let me uh, place in the context of what we've been working in the last few years with Natalia Ruguete, where is this conversation that we have about what it means a bubble in uh, social media and how we're thinking about this problem uh, of what does it mean to live in a bubble. So in the last few years, we've been working on three related agendas. One that deals with how frames are uh, uh, activated by social media peers. Another one uh, that relates to news sharing in social media, and another one that evaluates risk and attitude change in response to social media exposure. Uh, those three agendas are connected with some key questions, uh, a couple of which we're going to be addressing today. Um, in regards to network activated frames, the core concept that we've been working on is how is content activated by peers and composes local frames in a network. And we think of framing in social media as a collection of different frame elements that are activated by a number of individuals and therefore every um, user in social media receives a combination of different frames that they observe. And our question is how this composition takes place. And we've been uh, working the last few years trying to see both experimentally and observationally how framing takes place when people are contributing different frequencies of contents to the wall of their peers. Uh, a related agenda, given that we want to see how people are activated content to compose frames, is uh, news sharing and content sharing more broadly. So uh, this is dominated by three questions that I will present later after Natalia finishes with her, uh, her section. Uh, the first one is why do users share news? And we're observing sharing from the standpoint of different users that have heterogeneous preferences. The second one is which contents or news are shared by users. Um, and that is observed from uh, the uh, component elements of frame that are being shared. Uh, 
And the third one is uh, which groups share similar news, which is cognitive congruence and how different uh, groups of users in social media uh, activate content that composes the frames that we are going to be talking about. What we are not going to be talking about in this conversation is some of the research that we've been done lately on COVID and how COVID is activated uh, and how frame elements uh, affect perceptions of personal risk, which we're happy to address in the Q&A as we move to uh, that section. So what we will show today is, is one question, but we're going to try to prove it in a couple of different ways and to show how it fits with the literature. What we want to show is um, that a bubble only requires sharing and ideology to be positively correlated. And I know that it sounds a bit abstract to begin with, but the notion is that ideologues that share at a higher frequency are going to see their content overrepresented in observational and experimental data. A lot of discussions about bubbles has focused on whether our peer network is diverse or not. However, the fact that we may have a diverse network does not mean that the content is diverse. Uh, differences in frequencies, if attention sharing uh, correlates with ideology, will produce a perception of bubbles, even if our peer network is diverse. And what we're going to show is how these changes in frequencies are going to relate to both uh, social media framing, social media activation, and a variety of effects on perceptions of um, cognitive congruence in our peer network in social media. So what we're going to do is I'm going to I'm going to pass a torch to Natalia so that she can present a, a general view of how we think about network activated frames. And once uh, she presents as a case, I'm going to try to support empirically uh, what she is presenting first. So thank you, Natalia. Thank you, Ernesto. Hello, uh, everybody. Uh, thanks to Pablo, Mora, and Facundo for the invitation. Uh, and also congratulations on the initiative. I appreciate very much this opportunity to share our work with all of us. Um, in, in this presentation, in my part of the presentation, um, I'll speak about uh, our work related to content sharing and new sharing. More exactly, we'll explain our uh, study of network activated frames we, we, we have been doing together with Tiago Ventura. Uh, slide, please. In the, in the first part, I'll talk about the hypothesis and the theoretical basis and Ernesto about the experimental approach. As, as we concentrate on content sharing and new sharing, I start with some general assumptions that, uh, uh, that are important in, in this presentation. The first one is that in order to activate and propagate content, the users need to share posts published by their peers. Why? Because as users share messages, they make them available to a wider public who can see that content in their feeds. The second one is that sharing behavior of interconnected users changes the frequency of the text, the images, and the endorsements observed by online peers. And finally, whenever we decide to share content on our hand, and when we expect content to be shared by other users on the other, we feed the subjective perception of polarization and the creation of social media bubbles. Next slide, please. As I said before, I'll introduce the study that is based on our model called Network Activated Frames. In this presentation, I'll start by defining framing which is considered an integral and active process of production, circulation, and reproduction of socially shared and persistent meaning over time. For Edmund, for example, framing means defining condition as problematic, identifying causes, conveying a moral judgment, and promoting improvement. This definition of framing is very useful for our work. And frames, in turn, are persistent patterns of cognition, interpretation, and presentation that organize the world 
for both journalists and readers. The next one, please. Now, what happened in social media? One important notion here is activation, especially in that scenario where framing is the result of how content is created and posted by users and how it is activated by their peers. When a frame of, of a message matches the usual scheme of a reader, some words and images become remarkable, understandable, memorable, and emotionally resonant. And it's in those cases, these frames elements are activated. That is why our research shows how the activation of content creates singular frames in a virtual community that differ from the ones creates in other areas of the network. Well, I mean, in a specific sense, the network activated frames explain two sides of the same coin. First, frames in social network are collectively constructed by user decisions to accept and activate those frames element that are cognitively congruent. Second, activation of messages by, by users changes the frequency of circulation of content that is amplified by algorithm users and the media too. And as a consequence, the user's reactions propagate certain frame elements within a virtual community that are different from the ones that circulate in other areas of the network. Next, please. To, to demonstrate our model empirically, we propose some additional statements in order to understand the creation of bubbles. First, ideologues are more likely to share frames they agree with. These patterns of association and interactions produce structure at the local level. And this, in turn, conditions the behaviors of users. Secondly, preferred contents of ideologues is amplified and overrepresented in some communities. And thirdly, ideologues users expect their ideologues friends to be more active and more extreme than they are. And, and to sum up my part, at least, network activated friends embody a dynamic model that allows us to observe which elements of a friend's frames are accepted because of the cognitive congruence they cause and which ones are ignored due to the dissonance they produce. Why? Because of the, uh, the, the changes in the frequency of frame elements in distinct, in distinct regions of a social network shape how individuals interpret, classify, and define situations and events. So, network activations create local frames in different areas of the social media. Okay? Uh, up to here, my part of the presentation. Now, uh, Ernesto will go on. Thank you very much for listening. So, uh, again, I'm going to be showing how uh, we can connect uh, the different types of information of contents that we see in social media so that we make sense of them and we can evaluate to what extent the perception of bubbles, the fact that we have higher frequencies of the information that is produced from some cognitively congruent colleagues, uh, peers is observed in the network, it only requires that sharing and ideology are positively correlated. Therefore, that as we, as we observe individuals that are more um, intensely, uh, individuals that are more intensely weight ideology, we also observe that they're sharing at higher rates content that is statistically different. Now, this provides us also with an opportunity 
sorry. This provides us uh, also with an opportunity to think about content sharing more broadly. And as I was saying in the beginning, we've been analyzing why uh, individuals share, how content is, uh, content is shared, and to what extent there are uh, congruent communities within regions of a network that are sharing that content. So let me present how visually we think about network activation and the composition of local frames in networks. So in front of you, you have three networks. One of them was the week prior to the election of Bolsonaro in Brazil, uh, which is the upper left uh, network that says Bolsonaro. The other one is uh, the network composed of 80 days of data gathering after uh, the disappearance and then uh, uh, found of the body of activist uh, Santiago Maldonado. Uh, and the third one is uh, the activity that we have uh, on the travel ban right after the assumption of uh, uh, Donald Trump to the presidency, uh, which trigger a number of demonstrations. What you see here are in, in each of these, you have different communities and you're gonna see that there are some varying structures in this community. So for example, here we have some halo that is outside of the core network of the Bolsonaro supporters. And this is composed mostly uh, from trolls and from high activity accounts that are operating politically. And we see, for example, also in, in Bolsonaro, there's here some, some uh, loss of account densities that you can see that is uh, the response to the decision by Twitter to eliminate some accounts that were uh, disseminating fake news during the campaign. You can see also this uh, appearance of a triangle that we have because there's a, a stronger push from the accounts on the periphery compared to the accounts that are at the center of the Bolsonaro network. You can see that there are different structures on each one of these different networks and their differences in size. Democrats are here larger than Republicans. Um, the opposition is more dispersed, but also is larger than the Bolsonaro. And there's a different, um, there are different communities here in the Maldonado network that I'm not gonna uh, go into greater detail now. When we think about where are news being shared in this network, we're going to find out that the uh, embedding of links to news articles in different regions of the network varies dramatically. So, for example, Twitter was much more prevalent in the opposition uh, during the election in Bolsonaro, uh, at the same time that YouTube was almost exclusively being distributed by the pro-Bolsonaro camp. The, some of the fake news mills that were more um, active during the Bolsonaro election, like Conexel Politica, uh, were very concentrated on the core of the Bolsonaro network, and some of the very well-known traditional media are at the center of the community, taking both some of the anti-Bolsonaro and some of the pro-Bolsonaro community. So if we take any point that is located here, for example, what, what we have to think is what kind of information do they receive? And if the information that they receive is a combination of uh, some content that is coming from La Folia, some content that is coming from Beja, some coming that is, is from peers in Twitter, Globo, YouTube, and we see that the combination that we have in Brazil is going to be different with Folia uh, providing less of a contribution than the opposition here, Conexion Politica being more relevant or Antagonista, which is uh, uh, the uh, uh, um, a uh, number of journalists that um, exited from Beja to form this pro Bolsonaro um, uh, news organization. So we have that in any point of the map, any content that, that is observed is going to be composing a different image, image that is locally distinct. So we can think of this in more general terms. When we think about hate speech, when we think about users, when we think about all the information that is being delivered, we're seeing the same kind of compositional events, which is what we define as network activated friends. So when we think about this information, uh, consider, for example, this tweet that we made up, of course, by Pablo, um, which is uh, retweeted by a retweet that we made up, of course, and, 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 and responded, reply, by Joe Biden. So we have here a, a, a fake tweet that has several different features that relate to uh, the information that is delivered in the tweet. We have also features that corresponds to the user. And we also have an affinity between the user and the individual that is replying or is retweeting or is engaging with this information. And the main question that you want to understand is when you share this tweet, 
how these features are connected together. And what will we show is that you can actually discriminate the different uh, incentives to share the tweet. And we call this the column view, the row view, and the cell view for reasons that will be clear in a second. So imagine that what we do is we count embeds. So we have different news organizations. One is Pablo, the other one is the New York Times, the other one is Clarín. We have a collection of different newspapers and we can collect these newspapers from left here to right. And then we have users from this user all the way to this user. So this matrix of embed is giving us information about what every user is doing in social media when they are retweeting, or we could also compose what they're uh, liking or when they are replying or any other activity in which they're engaging with each other. As I was saying, we call this a, col a column view because information that this direction is, is uh, communicating relates to the uh, news organizations or to the hate speech content that we're analyzing or to the user accounts that we try to uh, evaluate. And we call this the row uh, uh, features because what we are seeing are differences in how individuals are willing to share information from these different events, from these different sources or these different terms. Then we have this cognitive congruence that happens at the cell level that is describing how the media and the user are interacting. Now, the interesting thing about this, uh, this view of the content that is being shared is that we can actually map it to three very distinct literatures that have emphasized on the one hand, the attention that some users may pay to the issue. So why do some users share more news is a question that in the um, in the uh, recent articles, although already 2015 by Compel um, uh, and colleagues, what uh, they show is that there's an entire literature uh, that emerges trying to figure out why different individuals are sharing information to a different extent. So we call this the row view of the information, but it corresponds to a whole set of literatures on news sharing, the same way that we can think more broadly about content sharing. We can also see that uh, there's a, a literature on the reputation of, of organizations and that the literature and reputation of media organizations is asking why are some media or some contests or some features of the, um, of the tweets that we analyze, why are they uh, shared more broadly? And of course, as I was saying, there are also congruence, a third type of literature that is described in 2015 in, in, in the article by Kumpel that mentions that uh, you have network and group effects where you have clusters that produce heterogeneous embedding of news sharing. Now notice the following in this matrix. I can actually go through the matrix and show that this M2, this media two, let's say for example, the New York Times is being embedded by a majority of the users and the counts, the total count that you have is larger. The same happened with this, the, the count is larger. On the other hand, the media three receives only two embeds. So in the column side, I can see that some organizations are more reputable or so contents are more prevalent than other contents. When I look from the row perspective, and therefore I see user by user, I can see that, for example, this user is embedding news from all the media to a larger extent. So this user is more interested in sharing information in general. We call this the attention or the row view of the process, as I was saying. And notice that when I see this matrix, I'm also observing that this individual is only retweeting or embedding or sharing information from the two left media, while on the other hand, the user number four is only sharing the information from the two right wing media. So in this matrix, I'm seeing very different relationships, some that have to do with the frequency going down, some with the frequency going sideways, and some that have to do with the um, congruence in the cell level between the users and the media. As you can tell by the equation above, this is actually something that we can do statistically, because this is the same as saying that we have random intercepts by row, that we have random intercepts by column, and that we have also uh, random slopes that connect the uh, uh, rows and the columns. The fact that uh, we can live in a bubble means that attention and uh, ideology are connected to each other. And that's what we're going to show both in the data and also in experimental data. So a bubble, as I was saying, only requires attention and ideology, rows and cells, to be positively correlated. 
And that means that perceptions of bubbles don't even have to consider how diverse is our network. It's just enough to see how the frequencies of the content are we relay, because again, we don't see users, we see combinations of contents. Users, the name that is putting the information forward is just one of the ways in which this content is being produced. So if attention and ideology are positively correlated, individuals will observe larger quantities of content that is preferred by ideologues. And in an article that we are uh, that, that we just resubmitted, um, what we show is is uh, um, how um, uh, having content that is overrepresented, uh, which is known as the friendship paradox, means that individuals perceive a social network environment that is more extreme, that is more ideological than what you would expect given the frequency. Sorry, given the uh, individuals that you have in a network. So given the equation that I was showing before, I can estimate the parameters for A, I can estimate the parameters for R, I can estimate the parameter for alpha, which tells me how important is ideology. So this alpha I is telling me how important for each user or for each quantile of user, if I can estimate it like that, uh, how important ideology is. Larger alpha, which means more negative numbers, uh, would imply that the decline, you know, as I move away from a media, I'm less likely to share it. So if, if the alpha is very large, it means that as I move away from the New York Times, I stop altogether sharing the New York Times. But if the alpha is close to zero, it means that it doesn't matter if I move away from the New York Times, I'm gonna still uh, embedding that news uh, paper uh, or that content at the same rate. So this alpha tells me how important ideology is. It doesn't tell me what ideology is, tell me how much it pulls, how much I stop sharing because ideology matters. And it's different than the distance. The distance, how closely related I am, is different than the weight, how much I care about ideology. Then attention means you know, the row vector, how likely is that I'm gonna be sharing information on this issue compared to other issues. So we can use observational data and obtain parameter estimates. In Brazil, for example, we can see that ideology matters way more for the left than for the right. And we can see that in the case of Maldonado, there's a very intense and extreme group on the right that cares a lot about ideology. We can also see that in the US, like in Brazil, the left and the right care more about ideology. And immediately you can see, as you look at the data, that attention is not really unrelated to ideology, that attention and ideology are connected to each other. So when we compare attention here and ideology here, we obtain very high correlations between 0.8 and 0.9 for each one of the three countries that we're analyzing. That means that Bolsonaro, in, in Bolsonaro, those that are uh, strongly, that care strongly, that care widely uh, about ideology, they're also paying more attention to uh, the information that is coming to the network in uh, Bolsonaro, in Twitter. When we look at Maldonado, the same thing, people that care, sorry, people that are ideologues, that alpha is very large, are also individuals that are paying a lot of attention. Okay, And when we consider the case of the tribal ban, we find the same thing. In all three cases, attention and ideology are closely connected to each other. And actually, we can show exactly the same result when we do an experimental analysis uh, of survey data. So, that means that if ideology and attention parameters are correlated at a very high level, a high level as we see, if you are an ideologue, you are paying attention, you're becoming more active. That means that you're sharing things that are congruent, but also that you're sharing more information in general. And that the people that are less ideological not only are sharing less because uh, ideology is mattering less, but also they're sharing less because they're less attentive. So the data in social networks becomes saturated with frequencies that come from ideologues rather than frequencies that are coming from everyone. We can also see the same thing in experimental data. So in experimental data, we have a different design. Let's think about the tweet that we have of Pablo and Joe Biden and think about an experiment in which we can uh, um, randomly rotate all the different frame elements. 
So we can rotate whether the author of the post is Pagina 12, which is a leftist outlet in Argentina, or La Nación, which is a conservative outlet in Argentina. And we can move them back and forth one side or the other. And we can change the text to make one text that is a, a cross the aisle type of text, where it's now the time to finish with the divisions and work together to take care of the health of the Argentines. Or we can consider a, um, a statement in which deflection of responsibility is saying that we are as we are because the previous government didn't do their due diligence. So we can rotate the text in which we're assigning blame or the text in which we are crossing the aisle. And we can rotate the pictures and we can put a, a, a uh, coronavirus picture, we can put an image of two, you know, the president and the vice president making the symbol of the Peronist party as a very in party, you know, talking to the to the in group uh, type of image, or we can have one in which they're crossing the aisle with the opposition candidate sitting right next to the president. So notice that as we rotate these things, what we can see is evaluate to what extent ideologues are willing to share one content rather than another one element of frame rather than another, but also we can ass assess to what extent they are willing to share that content. So when we do this experimentally, and we did this in Argentina, in Brazil, and in Mexico, in three different experiments with three different conjoints, we are rotating these frame elements, and we are evaluating to what extent ideologues are sharing the tweets compared to the non-ideologues. And what we have is that ideologues are uh, in Mexico, sorry, in Argentina, the non-ideologues are sharing this 28%, uh, and the ones that are ideologues uh, share this 36%, uh, and that the ones in Brazil that are uh, non-partisans are sharing 42%, while the partisans are sharing 44% smaller difference, but statistically uh, significant, and that the um, uh, users in Mexico that are nonpartisans are sharing 31%, and the ones that are partisan are sharing 37%. So what you can tell is that there's a huge increase in sharing in Argentina, or a very significant one, you know, from 28% to 36%. Uh, percent is an increase is almost uh, uh, 30%. There's an increase a small increase of only 5% in the case of Brazil, and there's a significant uh, increase of about 20% sharing in uh, Mexico. To put it bl bluntly, that means that uh, the, uh, the content that is preferred by ideologues is shared 30% uh, um, um, uh, 30 more here, is shared 5% more here, and is shared almost 20% more in the case of Mexico. So, in the case of uh, the first question, do ideologues share more than non-ideologues, uh, we find in all three cases that yes. Then, do ideologues share different frame elements than non-ideologues? And in Brazil, in Argentina, and I'm not putting here in Mexico, of course they do, there are differences of to what extent. An interesting feature that we find that might be worth discussing is that text and pictures have an outsized effect compared to the endorsement. Although we have done several experiments in which endorsement, who's the author, Pagina 12 or Nación, for example, New York Times or Fox News, there are a lot of evidence that people are more willing to share one or the other. We find that in the total sharing, um, um, the total sharing effect of the media uh, that is being that is endorsing the content, the effect is smaller than in the text and in the images that we are placing. So what does that mean? That means that when we think about uh, social media frames uh, that are being created by sharing content among uh, partisans, we have to think first on the row effect, why are people sharing? Second, on the column event, why some content share more than other? Third, on the cell event, what is the role of cognitive congress and in different specification of affect? in the um, sharing of this content. And once we put these things together, we can see that we do not need uh, to analyze uh, friendship um, heterogeneity to see that there are no bubbles. We can perfectly see to what extent the data that is bubble-like is being overrepresented in our networks. 
So once we evaluate uh, different types of content sharings from hate speech to news sharing, then we can also compare to what extent there are some more bubble-like effects when we think about hate speech or when we think about news sharing or when we think about endorsements and to what extent that is critical to our understanding of social media events. So um, that is what we had uh, to present here. As I was saying, there are a number of different experiments that we've done to test the different uh, news sharing mechanisms and the effect that it has on subjective perceptions from risk to the COVID um, to um, uh, parties and affect uh, and assimilation and contrast. So um, I think that's what we have. Thank you very much, uh, Ernesto and Natalia. This has been a wonderful presentation uh, with a lot, a lot of uh, for continued thinking about our uh, behavior on social media. So I would like to um, invite again the audience to introduce their questions in the Q and A uh, button at uh, the bottom of the of the screen. Um, and you, you can also ask questions in Spanish if you feel more comfortable. Um, so I, I will I will start with one question um, regarding um, so th there there are studies and I'm thinking particularly one paper published what, uh, by Mora Matasi, Pablo and Eugenia Michestein about uh, that there are uh, different uses uh, for different social media platforms that people have different practices and and there are different predictors that uh, tell us something about uh, who use different social media uh, platforms. And I was thinking, for instance, if I remember correctly, uh, in the case of uh, Twitter, uh, usually more educated or more affluent uh, older people tend to use this platform, uh, for example. So I want, uh, and in one of the graph you you show, uh, I think that uh, comparing Twitter with uh, YouTube uh, data. So I want to, uh, if you can uh, give us more information uh, from your analysis about that, like these differences in different platforms uh, in terms of behavior or uh, sharing activity or willingness to share uh, content. Thank you. Okay, just just a little bit and um, maybe Ernesto can um, can complete my answer. Um, in this in this uh, plot, we we um, we didn't compare different platform platforms. We uh, see the, um, the the embed links in Twitter. What happened with users in Twitter when we uh, embed different links from YouTube, from newspapers, from other peers. But what we analyze is the, um, the sharing contents in Twitter. And Thank you, I sorry. I yes, I, I was um, looking for uh, some information that is interesting. Um, that I think is going to speak directly to that. So I'll show it in a second. So let me, uh, as, as uh, Natalia was saying, um, we uh, there, there are two reasons why there are significant differences across platforms. And I think that from our standpoint are interesting. Of course, there are other reasons. But um, when we think about sharing in different social media platforms, we think on the one hand on different constituency that they have. Uh, so the row effect. And also uh, we think on the different topology of these networks. So if we think, for example, on WhatsApp, what is WhatsApp is like a long strip. To move from the front to move to the back is difficult. So moving in, in WhatsApp means that the information is gonna move slowly and needs to have relays on different communities. When we think about uh, Twitter, on the other hand, there are differences that are compositional that have to do with a different constituency, as you would say, more educated, more interested in politics, but also in topology. The degrees of freedom of Twitter are very few. So with two and a half uh, degrees of freedom, you connect pretty much everything that happens in any um, uh, network in um, uh, any of the countries that we're analyzing. So our uh, path distance in Twitter is very short, and that means that communication is amplified very quickly, while the path distance in WhatsApp is very slow. So it means that it requires a lot of work. And that's why they produce so many parallel accounts in the case of Brazil to try to amplify the message, and that's why that uh, community was, was shut down. 
Now, on the other side, the other issue that you raised, I think is very interesting. And, and let me show you, we did this uh, analysis of uh, the legalization of, um, of abortion uh, of the EVA, which is called in Argentina. And therefore in the survey, not only we have uh, instruments to analyze um, the, um, the, the um, attitudes and the reaction of individuals to our treatments, but we also have a battery of interesting questions. Uh, one of them is whether they use Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, et cetera, and to what extent they were supportive of the proposition that abortion should be legal, going from zero, not legal, to 10, absolutely legal. And we have significant differences on the constituency of each one of the networks. So for example, those that only use Facebook and didn't use Twitter, um, were the ones that were more conservative, 4.4 on a zero to 10 scale. And we have the, those, that, those that only use Twitter and they don't use Facebook were the most progressive. They were at 7.1. So we have a huge difference. In fact, this jump from Facebook to Twitter compositionally is extremely large. And it speaks you know, more than anything. In this case, there is no topology. It speaks to different constituency. But interestingly enough, what we have here when they use Facebook and Twitter is different from um, using only one of them. And when they don't use Facebook and Twitter, it's not actually outside. The ones that are not using Facebook or Twitter are in the uninformed, in the uninformed section of the uh, response rates. So to summarize, I, I think you're absolutely right. Different platforms have different effects and they have different effects because they have different topologies. So they have different propensity to activate content. You're differently likely to see content in the terms that we were showing in activation. And you're also uh, different in composition. What is important, I think, for research is to be able to separate, to parse out these different effects. I think that it makes um, an incredible contribution when we can uh, uh, truly measure the effect of the topology separate from the effect of congruence separate from the effect of the social composition. Because what we want is to see how frames are being communicated on this set of different issues, different vectors that are increasing or decreasing the rate at which we're sharing content. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so we have uh, one question from the audience. Uh, it said, uh, this is, was such an interesting presentation. Thank you both for such, uh, uh, so much for sharing this. I'm curious uh, to know more about the relationship between ideology and attention parameters within networks when analyzing information that supports the idea that ideologues share more information and saturated networks what factors are taken into account in order to measure this for instance public versus private sharing of posts should i start Okay, so um, to, to place it again in the framework, not, not, notice that I think that the expression in Argentina is when you have a hammer, everything is a nail. Uh, to some extent, we tend to think, I think of the um, factors that influence uh, these differences in attention and ideology as this compositional effect. So the, the two questions uh, that come uh, is imagine that you have, for example, as, as uh, you know, uh, Val indicates, uh, public versus uh, private uh, sharing of posts. In, in the framework that we have with Natalia, the fact that it's private means that the uh, activation has a, a, slow, a smaller amplification than when it's public. So when we think about the relationship between attention and ideology, the um, even if you have exactly the same individual and it's both attentive and an ideologue, the amplification of what is being produced is going to be different. So um, the, um, the relationship between ideology and attention for us is general because we can see it both in observational data in different types of networks and in experimental data. The extent to which that amplifies a frame needs to be measured in the context of the frames that are being analyzed, because it depends on to what extent you can amplify um, and the frames and what kind of frames are being combined. Um, in Facebook, we were just showing that the constituency of Facebook is more conservative. Given that it's more conservative and amplification is smaller, we have this kind of two dynamics in which, uh, on the one hand, the contents that are being amplified are more conservative, attention is going to be higher, but the uh, propagation of the frames is going to be slower than the case of uh, Twitter. 
So um, I, I think that what we have is one general finding, the relationship that is attitudinal, and then one mechanism to evaluate how it propagates and amplifies and it kind of um, frames that are locally produced. And, and uh, on the first one, I think the finding is general. On the second one, it's not. I'm not sure, Natalia, if... All right. Uh, so uh, another question said, uh, sharing is part of the process when analyzing bubbles. It is what we can measure, at least it is more visible, let's say, but hyperpartisanship indicates that such kind of user uh, consult a diversity of media input, though they might share just the selected one. Do you guys equate the inputs of information, exam for example, following patterns on user diets or plan to consider at some point of your research? That's a, a fabulous question. I'm not sure. So, so we have a project with Natalia that we're implementing where, the, where we're trying to um, measure this third uh, requirement that that was uh, mentioned by Marcelo is, is Marcelo or sorry uh, I wasn't sure so um, imagine that I had three sources of data one is the data I observe in the network the other one is the data that I observe experimentally and the third one is the browsing history of the person what the question is asking which is extremely interesting is to what extent I am exposed to content in my browsing history that is very different from what I'm activating if that happens, it could be that the individual that is activating content sees a lot of very heterogeneous things that are not a bubble. He's only activating things that contribute to the bubble, but it could be that what we see is publicly a bubble and underneath a current, not just where we have different friends, but also in which my browsing history is more diverse than the one I'd see. Now, there's, there's a, a different set of ways in which I can think of this. Clearly, it is interesting if the person has a more diverse undercurrent, at least his browsing history. On the other hand, it is an interesting question, why is this person only sharing things that are more ideological? What we need, I think, are more of these studies that can connect those three stages to see to what extent individuals that are more ideological are also less likely to have a less diverse browsing history than individuals that are more ideological. And that would be not just a question about attention and ideology, but also about attention, ideology, and communication of the content. To what extent people communicate something different than what they are being exposed to. So in, in, the, in the new study that we hope to field uh, by the end of this year, what we are trying to see is to think the same cube, uh, sorry, the same matrix that I was seeing, rows, columns, um, and cells. You can also think about rows, columns, cells, and depth, where the depth are these other pieces of information, these other vectors that uh, would showcase that people might think differently about what they see, browsing history, and what they do, sharing content. Uh, Paulus, uh, next question said, when dealing with controversial topics on social media, for example, politics, eating disorders, religion, what are the potential risks of having overrepresentation of people with a specific ideology and attention levels in these networks as they are guiding the conversation and content exposure within their respective bubbles? Oh, okay, um, just just uh, just engage a little bit. Um, Twitter is is not a, a democratic platform of communication. Uh, but uh, for me, what is uh, very important to, to emphasize is that um, framing is in, in, a, an, in an interact, interactive uh, and comprehensive uh, theory uh, that needs message being activated. It's not only the power of who is the emissor of the message, but who is the interaction, uh, which is the interaction that is happening in, in every platform, in, in every scenario. So, but the, the overrepresented of some uh, idol of some intense users, it's very important to analyze what is happening in the communication, the process of communication in, in this platform, uh, especially, but in other platform, platforms too. Absolutely, um, and and uh, the um, in, fa in fact, um, uh, Natalia 
has been an expert on agenda setting and um, and, and I think I tend to think more on issue salience and agenda setting. The question is right at the intersection of this. Imagine that I'm speaking about uh, you know an issue. And we've been dealing with this on, on our study of, it, of fact checking. Now, fact checkers oftentimes disprove something that is false and they raise the visibility of the thing that is false. And issue attention and agenda setting are two important features that happen when we have a, a controversial topic on social media uh, where uh, the activity of ideologues is very intense. So we, we might take, for example, something that is Justin Bieber. And we know that when Justin Bieber appears in social media, people that are big fans or hate Justin Bieber are going to be very intense and they're going to come out. As they do that, everyone that is not a Justin Bieber fan is going to see the salience or importance of Justin Bieber going up. So with, in, in politics, all the time we're dealing with the fact that as we uh, talk about an issue, we raise, raise the salience and we not only raise the salience for the individuals that care about the issue, but also the salience to the individuals that do not care about the issue that perceive that is more important. So going to what Val was asking, when we deal with controversial issues and we zoom and we put you know, the, the magnifying glass on that controversial issue, we're also raising the salience for everyone that is not involved in that issue. Now, what we have is that ideologues tend to be also uh, more narrow-minded on the kind of issues that they raise. And that means that the visibility of the issues that they care about, not just the content, also increases. Definitely, that's a, a, a different way of read um, and the uh, attention and ideologue, not from the standpoint of content composition, as we're thinking about framing, but also on the salience issue, which we didn't talk today. Uh, great. We have another question. Uh, you probably already answered this partially, but um, I will ask it again, and maybe you can add uh, more information on this. this uh, there are different users for social media platform, would you be able to postulate the same results for users of Facebook, especially in terms of framing? Would it be slightly closer? So um, let me just say something briefly. I don't know if, if that I want to add later. Uh, we are analyzing consumption patterns, and we do have consumption patterns for Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, etc. Uh, they, in our view, they they look very similar. That the, the difference is in the topology, but not so much on the psychology of the users. Uh, of course. Uh, becoming an expert in Facebook or becoming an expert in Twitter also means to change a bit your psychology. When you become an expert in an area, you learn to interpret data slightly different. So if you are an expert in Twitter and Facebook, you learn different quirks on how to operate with the platforms. And, and that's uh, definitely going to be a difference on how uh, the features of the platform and the type of contents are going to be activated. But the psychology that connects ideology and attention, we think is very general. Um, doesn't depend on Facebook and Twitter. Um, so, so again, I think that is worth thinking about how each one of these features contribute and what is general so that uh, once we know the topology and the other features, we can recover the framing and what things are not, to what extent we need the local frames. Thank you very much, Ernesto. Thank you very much, Natalia. We're exactly at time. Thanks a lot, Facundo, for great moderation. Thanks to the audience for staying with us uh, through the end. And once again, thanks, Natalia. Uh, thanks, Ernesto. And I want to invite everybody uh, to join us for next Thursday uh, seminar by Vanessa Diaz um, about her new book on celebrities, paparazzi, and the Latino community. Uh, have a great rest of your weeks and thanks again. Thank you very much. Bye Thank bye. you.